Welcome to the second session of Vizat. Um, we had a very interesting session this morning. Um, and to kick us off with this, uh, this evening, we have a keynote talk from Aaron Hertzman. Um, I don't think I really need to introduce him very much, um, but interestingly, his history within art goes all the way back to a bachelor's in computer science and art history. He's an ATM fellow and recently become an IEEE fellow and currently is a principal scientist at Adobe. In 2018, he received um, a well-received paper on can cre computers create art? And today he's going to talk to us about human visual perception of art as computation. So I'd like to hand over to Aaron to begin his talk. Great. Um, share my screen and um, so, uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, all right, I will assume you can hear me. Um, uh, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how we as humans perceive art. It's obviously something that people have thought about and studied and had insights about for, for centuries, exploring cultural and social and historical and many other aspects of this uh, question. Um, here, I want to talk about how compu uh, computational models can give us insights into the perception of art. And specifically, things, ideas from computer graphics and computer vision can help us model the visual process. Uh, and this will give us and can give us ideas that uh, were not necessarily available to other approaches for studying art uh, and can build on and be complementary to them. And in particular, I'm going to explore two uh, specific areas or two parts of this talk. The first is about line drawing as a special case of uh, realistic uh, illustration. And the second part is about uh, ambiguity, ambiguity in art and which is relevant for abstract and contemporary art. And so I'll start with line drawing. Um, and I want to also, you know, I want to begin with the assumption that our visual perception is uh, evolved, or shall we say, optimized for real-world scenes. Our, we have visual systems so that we can navigate and survive in the real world, and as a result, we're able to very quickly and accurately understand the content of a scene with objects that we've never seen before. We've never seen the materials. We don't know the lighting or shape in advance, and yet from a, a brief uh, uh, viewing of one of these images, we can tell very quickly a lot about what's going on inside of it. So this is a problem for art because line drawings are not a real world percept. We don't see line drawings walking around the real world. And so there's a big question of why is it that we should be able to understand what's going on in a line drawing so easily? Like why don't we just see these as black marks on a page or on a wall? Um, and this is something that uh, philosophers have discussed for some time. Uh, one idea is simply that depiction styles are learned. So just in the same way that you learn to uh, read and write written language, maybe we also learn to read and write uh, to, to understand pictures. Um, but I, I find this a little bit hard to believe for various reasons. One is that um, many, some of the key elements of drawing seem to persist throughout uh, centuries, through cultures, uh, and so on. Um, and also there are a variety of uh, perceptual studies on untrained subjects. So maybe the most peculiar and most famous one was one by uh, Hochberg and Brooks where they raised their uh, newborn child uh, in a way where they uh, avoided exposing him to any images whatsoever uh, for the first 14 months of his life. And after 14 months, they showed him a picture, a drawing, and he was able to recognize it as a car. Uh, they showed him a photo, he could recognize it as a car as well. And they you know, ran various other images. Um, and then, since then, there are many other studies that replicate that uh, basic uh, evaluation in a more rigorous way, uh, visiting members of various tribal societies that don't have uh, pictures uh, and so on. Um, and the conclusion is pretty clear that someone who has never seen a drawing before can still recognize what's uh, in it. Um, and there's even similar studies for uh, chimpanzees that have uh, preliminary but similar conclusions. So that, that's really the question, why is that? Um, now, of course, as I'm sure everyone knows, there's been a considerable amount of study within the perception and computer vision literature on the geometry of including contours. Um, but this work doesn't really uh, answer the question of why it is we're able to identify including contours or how we do it uh, in the first place. So the sort of idea that I think is sort of like conventional wisdom uh, among at least a lot of vision and perception researchers, at least a lot that I've talked to is, based on the observation that if you run an edge detector on an image, on a photograph, often you get something that looks like a line drawing. 
Uh, and moreover, we know that the human visual system in early visual processing, specifically in the visual cortex, includes edge-sensitive edge neurons. There, so there is something like edge detection happening in the human visual system. And so this uh, idea is sort of like people treat this as kind of an explanation for line drawing. Uh, but when you actually try to turn this, these observations into an actual a theory, or, uh, then you run into a lot of problems. And in fact, the only uh, um, technical article I've found that tries to articulate this as a theory points out there's lots of issues with the theory. Um, in particular, uh, first of all, edge images are not drawings. So if you take an arbitrary uh, rendering or photograph, such as A here, uh, and you compute its edges, you get a lot of um, lines that a typical artist would not draw. Um, and so you will also lose edges that an artist op often would draw. Uh, and there's some images for which the edges give you a completely different percept than the original uh, image. Um, and it's also, you know, we're all obviously sensitive to other things besides edges. We have, you know, in the, even the visual cortex, we could respond, we respond to colors and textures bar uh, features, center surround features. Why are, this, this theory doesn't really answer the question why we ignore all of these other features when perceiving line drawings. And it still really begs the question of why, why this would be. Why is it that edge image, why, why should we understand line drawings as shapes when they're not percepts from the natural world? So my goal in this first part of the talk is to explain line drawing in terms of realistic image perception. So in other words, uh, given a system like the human visual system that is very good at uh, taking a natural image's input and perceiving shape in that image, why, why should that uh, system be able to infer shape and line drawings? In order to uh, address this question, I want to take a bit of a detour, so I'm going to uh, go to talk about non-photorealistic rendering for a while. Um, and non-photorealistic rendering is a subfield of computer graphics where our goal is to develop algorithms that will take 3D models or images as input and produce artistic images in some way. So this is an algorithm uh, that, the output of an algorithm that takes the 3D model as input and produces line drawings from them. This is a subfield of computer graphics that's been around for 60 years. And there's lots of really nice research in the area, lots of algorithms that can produce many different kinds of visual styles, often looking quite good. And algorithms from this field have made their way into a variety of video games and uh, feature films and short animations as well. And in some way, I think non-photorealistic rendering provides us a generative model for representational art. It gives us an abstraction of what are the things an artist does when they uh, create a realistic depiction of a, of a 3D scene. Um, like every model, it's incomplete. It doesn't describe the whole process. There's many things it doesn't model. But like many models, it is useful in some ways in, in understanding some aspects of of how we make uh, images. So the one of the core building blocks of non-photorealistic rendering are occluding contours, which, as I mentioned, originally the study of occluding contours is from perception and computer vision. Um, so for a 3D scene like this, we can, here's, this is a 3D object, we can complete its uh, uh, occluding contours and make a nice tune rendering of it. Um, and we can also stylize those curves to make a stylized rendering. Um, the conventional uh, description of occluding contours is geometric. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with this, that uh, occluding contours are points where the view vector grazes the surface or n dot v is uh, zero. The details are not important if you're not familiar with this. There's another way of understanding occluding contours, however, that is, I think, more useful uh, for perception. And that's as follows. You have, suppose we have a 3D scene. And uh, imagine that we paint all the objects white with a diffuse material, so Lambertian reflectance, get rid of all of the lighting except for a headlight, so it's as if the viewer is wearing a light uh, on their, above their eyes. And then we get a rendering uh, under that model that looks like this. And um, in this model, the, the reflectance of the pixel is n dot v, um, which means that the, pixels were the, uh, the pixel values are zero, are exactly the occluding contours. Tracing out the, end of the pixels with zero reflectance gives us the occluding contours. And that can produce a rendering like this. Now for this model, obviously the occluding contours are a little bit empty, even though they, they make sense as, as drawing curves. But we could actually extend that idea a little further and uh, trace lines along this image, not just where n.v equals zero, but where there's a dark valley 
where there's dark rigid valleys in the image so that we get this basically. Um, and this set of curves are called the, uh, there's occluding contours and then the suggestive contours um, in this image here. And as you can see, it uh, produces results that, to me, I, I certainly think it looks a lot more like a line drawing uh, that a human might make. We can even go a little further than that, which is to thicken these strokes based on the thickness of uh, these dark bands uh, in the diffuse rendering and get this image, which uh, is getting, I think, closer and closer to more uh, typical line drawing styles. Uh, here's another example with a 3D model. And again, you can see that even though it's, it's, a, it's just a model, it's not perfect, um, it captures a lot of elements of how people draw, draw line drawings. Uh, one way we can evaluate this is qualitatively. So this is an example where uh, my student built this 3D model on the right based on this drawing. And then we animated it with one of, one of these rendering algorithms. And as you can see, it does a, a decent job of generalizing to different viewpoints. Um, in this case, there's only two or three parameters in the algorithm. So there's no machine learning here. There's no big deep network with lots of parameters to tune. It's a very simple analytical model. Um, there's much more rigorous evaluation that was performed by uh, Forster Cole and colleagues where they uh, printed out renderings of a bunch of 3D scenes, asked a set of human artists to, to draw faithful, accurate line drawings of them and compare those to the computer generated line drawings. And they found a very good overlap between the two sets. Um, not perfect, but there's a lot of uh, uh, features of real line drawings that these algorithms accurately capture well. Um, as you saw, those previous methods are a little noisy, and we had a paper at CVPR earlier this year that cleans them up uh, by combining ideas from machine learning together with these uh, geometric algorithms. So with that background, we can now come back to the perceptual question, why is it line drawings work? Uh, and this is a paper that I published in the uh, Perception Journal earlier this year. And again, uh, we, I believe that, uh, or I want to start with the assumption that we are good at perceiving shape in real world scenes. And my main hypothesis is that the human visual system interprets a line drawing as it would some corresponding realistic image or as if it were some realistic image. So in particular, um, given this line drawing, there's some corresponding um, 3D rendering that is similar to it that we would be perceiving it as. In particular, this line drawing uh, roughly approximates a scene where we have some unknown geometry. The scene has a Lambertian white material. We have a point light source, which is roughly at a headlight location or you know, behind the viewer's head. And even though these lighting uh, conditions are not together something we would normally see in the real world, they're all individually things that are quite common in the real world. And it's reasonable to expect we could understand a uh, real scene with these conditions. And these are the conditions essentially of non-photorealistic rendering line drawing. So there's a more generalized version of this hypothesis, which is simply that line drawing perception is a consequence of realistic image perception. So for the reasons that I stated, this system, a system that can perceive shape in real scenes can sh perceive shape in line drawings. And moreover, I, one can predict that a model trained to do, that can, a model, a computational model that can perform human level robust shape perception from a single natural image ought to be able to also perceive shape in line drawings. Um, and in the first version of my paper, I wrote this down and a reviewer said, well, you, current vision models are pretty good. Maybe you should try it. Um, and I didn't really think it was gonna work because um, we have just so much problem with domain shift across different computer models, but I figured I should try it since that's what the reviewer said. So I got one of the then state of the art uh, single image depth prediction me uh, methods. So this is a method that has a deep network that takes a photograph as input, produces a depth map, and it's trained in a large set of real uh, photograph and depth map pairs. It does not include any art, artistic you know, drawings or paintings in this data set, all real photographs. Um, and I found a few places where it didn't give perfect results. I had to really hunt for these. Like there's some places where qualitatively the results are really off. But overall, qualitatively, it seems like it did a really good job of getting estimating relative depth. So I applied it on, on some line drawings and actually I was, I was personally surprised that it actually worked pretty well. Qualitatively, a lot of the depth relationships in these scenes are, are accurately estimated. And you can get a little sense of where, you know, how it's getting a rough sense of accurate depth um, from these sort of 3D animations. I, I hope the animation is playing over video. There are certainly cases where it didn't work well, but these are scenes that uh, don't really exist in the methods training data set. The method didn't see apples floating in space or, or chariots in the sky. Um, 
So that seems like solid evidence in favor of this uh, hypothesis. Uh, moving beyond that, in fact, we can then start to see, we can, uh, interpret a lot of kinds of realistic artists as sort of inverse vision. And people have expressed this idea in various ways in the past that suppose we can think of art as an answer to this fo a following problem. You're an artist and you have a model, a 3D scene that you wish to convey. Uh, and you, you can only do that with a black pen on white paper and you're not allowed to draw hatching. You can only draw outlines. Um, what, is, what are the sets of lines you can draw such that a, a viewer of natural scenes or a, a person who has only seen line drawings ever before in the past, sorry, let me restate that. A viewer that has only seen real images in the past, how do you draw lines such that they will perceive the shape that you intend or as close as possible? Um, and what I've described is an explanation for why uh, line drawings that we know using included contours are a solution to this problem. Uh, moreover, this suggests that we can think of, we can generalize this idea of art as a sort of perceptual optimization uh, for stylization algorithms. And there's been a few uh, approaches in the past that treat uh, stylization of images as optimization for a, a viewer. Uh, but there's a lot more uh, opportunities to exp explore this idea more in the future. So I think that's a uh, pretty uh, compelling or plausible hypothesis for uh, smooth curves. I've all, so far, I've only talked about uh, including contours, suggestive contours on smooth objects. There are a lot of other types of curves that people draw um, that require um, other explanations. And my goal has been to try to, I want to you know, convince you a little bit that other kinds of curves will fall into the same theory. For example, hatching is a very simple example, very realistic hatching. It's very easy to see how this um, can be interpreted as an approximation to uh, a natural image. Uh, inverse lines where you draw with light strokes in a dark background, I think can be viewed as a form of rim lighting. So these images here, are, these are three photographs with the, which have some form of rim lighting, which is a photographic technique where you set up light sources uh, off to the side of the, your subject. Creases are a little bit more difficult to uh, explain and describe. So um, in the, what do we mean are like C1 discontinuities in objects in, in what, why do we draw these uh, sharp edges? Um, and in the paper, I describe a couple of different possible explanations for creases. So more generally, if you look through the perception literature, um, you might, I, you kind of get the impression that, that perception researchers in the past have treated line drawings and photographs as completely separate uh, concepts that uh, use separate explanations. But I really think they should be explained within the same framework. Um, there's no really any clear separation be, between these concepts. Um, I, I really think there's a continuum in visual styles. We add slightly more and more amounts of hatching and shading and color sippling or various other techniques there's not a clear boundary you can say these are art images and these are photographs and there's a real question of how do we perceive shape and identity across such a variety of styles moreover how is it that we're able to identify that somehow some strokes are really about style and they're really approximate depictions and some strokes really represent specific objects and how is it that we're able to interpret all these different styles um, in terms of shape and back throughout the style of the patient so i think there's a lot of interesting further questions that this approach of viewing image uh, Im, uh, art as approximate realism uh, uh, opens up. Now let's switch gears to talking about uh, ambiguity in art. Uh, of course, line drawings have their own sorts of ambiguities, but really in the modern contemporary art, we saw, see ambiguity explored uh, very heavily. Um, in order to talk about ambiguity, I wanna begin by showing this image, which at first may seem uh, completely abstract, a, a pattern of shapes. Uh, as you look at it, you might see a shape in here. Uh, specifically, there's a frog. Maybe upon being told there's a frog, you might see it. Or maybe you, you might see it after being shown the frog. Um, and after you've been told, after some time, then uh, hopefully you begin to recognize it as a frog and see it as a frog. So to think about ambiguity, I want to uh, discuss or start from two principles of perception and action. The first is that certain images and scenes are naturally ambiguous, uh, and there are different kinds of ambiguities and different kinds of things that we might um, struggle to understand, and that we seek to resolve uncertainty. Uh, it is 
valuable for us to navigate the world and to survive in the world, to gather information. And in certain situations uh, are ones that often uh, suggest that we could find more information if we worked a little bit harder. Uh, and in particular, to, to reason, think about uncertainty and discuss it, I, I, I personally uh, think about the notion of the Bayesian brain, that we have probability distribution sort of implicitly represented in our brain, uh, even if they're not explicitly represented. So uh, a simple example, an image on the left, after, for, um, uh, after some time, you have a very simple distribution, clearly it's a tiger. Uh, the value of you know, resolving some Im images should be pretty obvious. Some very specific kinds of images uh, are bistable. So this is the famous uh, young woman, old woman illusion that can be interpreted in two different ways. So even after perceiving it for a while, there's a, implicitly a distribution that you could perceive it either as young or old. Uh, and really you can flip back and forth between these two interpretations. And again, um, resolving these ambiguities is useful for making, our cho making choices and choosing action in the future. So we really have a uh, desire to resolve these ambiguities. Uh, one other uh, key observation is that viewing duration matters, as I've sort of indicated. So initially, you might uh, you know, not perceive any shape or object in a scene, and it's have a uniform distribution over explanations about where it came from. And then after some uh, time, that might resolve into a more specific or more concrete interpretation. Now, especially when talking about uh, modern and contemporary art, I want to uh, use the notion of visual indeterminacy. This is a, a term coined by an artist researcher named Robert Pepperell. And it's something I've, I've found really useful in, uh, in my own appreciation for contemporary art. Um, and he uses this term to describe uh, images like this. So this image here is something where at first, it, it, your first impression uh, often is that it looks like a real object, uh, some simple object with three points. But as you study it, it never resolves in a coherent shape. It defies coherent interpretation. And so indeterminacy is uh, the notion of it is described an image that at first appears like it ought to be simply interpretable, and yet it never resolves into a coherent explanation. This is something which has existed in some form throughout art history, but really started to show up in the past few hundred years. So Turner uh, uh, is one example of an artist who produced a lot of images that refer to real scenes. So this is a sunset. Um, and it, I think it's, you know, it makes sense as a sunset and yet identifying the individual objects, you, you might think it's possible, but it seems very difficult. Indeterminacy became uh, an important valued concept in the modern art era. So for example, Picasso said, when looking at a picture, one should say that the more associations it can open up, the better. So indeterminacy is really something that, and ambiguity in general, something that people uh, deliberately tried to create uh, within modern art. Um, uh, the painter Gerhard Richter uh, more simply has simply said, I don't like pictures that I understand. Uh, and this is uh, one of his works, which is called Annunciation After Titian. Um, and Richter has actually, even though he's an artist, described the, this process in a perceptual description. He said, we only find paintings interesting because we search for something familiar. And usually we find this similarity as a table, blanket, and so on. When we do not find anything, we are frustrated, and that keeps us excited and interested. So he's basically saying that, you know, he's describing this, this perceptual theory that we look at images searching for, me, for searching for coherent physical explanations, and this search keeps us interested in, in these ambiguous artworks. Now, these ideas have been explored uh, quite a bit within the psychology and neuroscience literature through a variety of perceptual and uh, neuroscience studies. And there's a lot of really interesting work to discuss and theorize about different kinds of ambiguities in art. Um, and th but a lot of the studies have been kind of high level. And I think there's sort of two reasons for that. One is there's a question of how do we get st uh, good stimuli for performing these studies? Um, usually these stimuli are uh, you know, sort of put together by the researchers themselves. For example, in one study, uh, the researchers uh, found a set of Magritte paintings modified them in, in Photoshop to produce less ambiguous uh, versions of the Magritte paintings, and then asked uh, participants to, to compare which ones were more interesting. And there's a lot of sort of fairly obvious issues with this methodology, but maybe the, um, the researchers' paintings were not as good as, not as interesting as the Magritte paintings, just because the researchers were not professional artists. 
And there's a second question of how we measure ambiguity in these images. And so far, these studies have just simply asked people which image is ambiguous or not. Um, and you know, we really like to get to a richer, more nuanced notion of the types of ambiguity. Um, so one you know, answer to how we could uh, address these questions comes from uh, a different part of computer vision, computer graphics, which is generative adversarial networks. And in fact, GANs or generative adversarial networks have been used by a lot of artists in the past few years. There's a ver variety of both established and um, sort of up and coming digital artists who have used these three artworks. This is an installation piece by Mario Klingemann that was uh, auctioned at, I think it was Sotheby's uh, last year. But both established artists like Trevor Paglin, up and coming artists like Helena Theron and Sophia Crespo and, and many, many others have been exploring and sort of taking to GANs as a tool for making art. Um, and I actually think this is not a coincidence. I think that GAN art, GANs naturally are predisposed to producing uh, this visual indeterminacy, this thing that makes them look like abstract art. Um, and in a paper that I'm presenting next week at SIGGRAPH published in Leonardo, I sort of ex expand on this argument that I think uh, GANs are sort of naturally predisposed, predisposed to indeterminacy. And if you use uh, Artbreeder, which is a website created by Joel Simon, which that lets you sort of reuse and explore the space of images created by one of these GANs, you can you really get a sense that it just naturally seems to produce these images that are evocative, intriguing, and suggestive that don't resolve into clear, coherent uh, three interpretations. So for the final part of uh, this talk, I want to describe work that we're uh, presenting in uh, Transactions and Applied Perception next month, um, where we're doing a very preliminary exploration of how we can explore ambiguity using our images from GANs. And this work was done uh, by a PhD student uh, she Wong. Uh, she's recently graduated and she's looking for a uh, job, so please contact her if you're interested. Um, also in collaboration with Zoya Bylinski and uh, Robert Pepperell. Um, and so our setup is as follows. We, uh, this is a, a GAN generated images from Artbreeder. Uh, we ask a crowd worker, a mechanical Turk, to view it for three seconds and then to describe it. And when we do this, the set of descriptions are pretty consistent. White fluffy cat, white cat, white cat, so on people generally agree it's a cat. Uh, on the other hand, for this image, we ask them to view it for three seconds and describe it. Our descriptions are all over the place. It's a calm shell, it's a robot looking swan, a, a giant snail. And so our main idea is that this variability in descriptions, uh, we think reflects the perceptual uncertainty in these images. Uh, so specifically what we did was we, uh, we can take the, all of the nouns that were used in these descriptions, uh, and combined synonyms. And we, the histogram is very consistent for the image on the left. Almost every description is a cat. Uh, and this other uh, category down here are uh, singleton nouns that only occur, occurred once. Uh, on the, for the image on the right, uh, the descriptions are, again, use all sorts of different nouns uh, in these descriptions. And if we compute the entropies of these descriptions, we get 1.8 bits for the one on the left, 5.5 from the one on the right. And so we, we see that we essentially have a measurement that for this more ambigu ambiguous image on the right says the entropy has more bits. So for this um, project, we gathered, uh, we went through the most popular images on our breeder and we gathered a data set of 150 images um, and we sort of roughly categorized them as being abstract, flat abstract, indeterminate, uh, dichotomous, meaning that they have two separate concepts within them and recognizable. And then we, we, we ran this the same experiment again and measured the entropies of people's descriptions of these images. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize that this, this is a very preliminary exploration. We uh, won't be able to draw any you know, strong conclusions from these results, but I think, I hopefully you'll agree that it's provocative and intriguing and, and suggests future directions. So here are the images that had the lowest entropy in this experiment. And uh, these are all images that are fairly recognizable. You can easily identify them as familiar objects. These are the images with the highest entropy and they're all quite indeterminate. They all are very suggestive of very different kinds of scenes, but none of them uh, is recognizable. And moreover, one uh, interesting thing we found was that the images that were highest entropy were the ones that were sort of most indeterminate by our initial classification. Whereas the purely abstract ones are the ones that are like just really more like flat shades of color had lower 
entropy by these measurements than the indeterminate ones. That is, um, people viewed them uh, less um, as less suggestive, provoking fewer ideas. Um, and this aligns a lot with Picasso's notion that um, the most valued images are the ones that suggest the most associations rather than being most ambiguous. Um, now, as I mentioned, the viewing duration we think matters as well. Um, and so we ran the same process using two different viewing durations. And so as you see for this image, after half a second, so the very short viewing time, uh, people had a smaller distribution, or the, there were fewer words that came up frequently as opposed to when image, uh, people had three seconds. And there's a whole set of words people use to describe the same seconds that they did not use after half a second. So we thought that we could also start to see uh, whether any categories emerge by using these two different measurements. So here are images that all have high entropy after three seconds of viewing that had the greatest decrease in entropy. So a large entropy after half a second and less entropy, but still high entropy after three seconds. And you can see that they're all fairly complex, evocative, but you can start to see them cohere into more consistent interpretations. Like this one on the right, you might seem like a mask or a face or or a monster of some kind, whereas after just half a second, you, you can't really tell anything. Here are the images with the greatest increase in entropy. People just sort of thought one or two things after first viewing, or a smaller set of things, and after a longer viewing, then their set of associations increased over time. Um, and here are images that are all less ambiguous after you've had some time to look at them, um, but they started out ambiguous. So for example, it's one in the middle after just a short brief viewing time, you might just see a flat field of colors. After a few seconds, you might just start to see a temple or a building facade of some kind. And we found dichotomous images were the converse um, that became more ambiguous over time or more varied. So at first, you might see this as a mushroom. Then you might see it as a mushroom with eyes on it or a mushroom, some kind of mushroom creature. Uh, and we, we could also plot um, the entropies of image, images by, or we plot the images by their entropies. So the, uh, Vertical axis is the entropy after three seconds. Uh, sorry, horizontal axis is entropy after three seconds. Vertical axis is entropy after half a second. Um, the recognizable images all have low entropy. Dichotomous images are all increasing, start low and increase. Um, the indeterminate ones are all uh, clustered at the top here. So to summarize this, this part of the talk, um, our hypothesis is that these variability and these freeform text uh, responses is some form of measure of the types of ambiguity and indeterminacy in the images. And we see that categorizations uh, emerge from uh, these measurements. Um, now, obviously our methodology is very simplistic. Um, I don't even have time to list all the problems or all the limitations of uh, what we did, uh, but hopefully it, it should, you know, there's a bunch of obvious ones that um, should be fairly obvious. Um, and we haven't yet correlated these, these uh, measurements to uh, aesthetic judgments. And we've, we've done a little bit of studies trying to ask mechanical torque wor workers, which images do they find more interesting or evocative? Um, and they all prefer, you know, realistic images of cats and mountains. Um, so somehow we're not, uh, you know, getting the, the uh, we're still investigating whether there's any, any sort of thing we can do there. But again, hopefully you find uh, I, I think that this is, uh, suggests that this approach has promise and that can be built on in the future to get more uh, solid conclusions. So to summarize, um, my main uh, claims here is that line drawing perception is a consequence of real world, uh, real image perception. And this suggests that we could uh, in the future begin to describe uh, more kinds of realistic uh, art, it, perception of realistic art images in terms of uh, our real world image perception. Um, and that indeterminacy can be understood in terms of perceptual ambiguity um, and perceptual uncertainty. And then we can begin to measure these, uh, this sort of indeterminacy and types of indeterminacy through these sorts of crowdsourced experiments. Um, and more broadly, there's a theme here that computational thinking gives us insights into the perception of art, thinking about um, vision and art creation as computational processes gives us interesting insights that uh, complement and build upon insights from other uh, types of academic study. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very and, much, Aaron, yep. for that talk. 
It was very interesting and uh, we've already got questions coming into the chat. So uh, I'll start to read some out and then you can perhaps answer a few. So we've got sort of 10 minutes to answer. Okay, so we have one from Angelo Kanawaska. Um, and they say, uh, love the entropy analysis. Have you noticed a relationship between um, interdependencies and the quality of GANs trained? For example, GANs that are not trained properly, older GANs that do not produce photorealistic results. Can they generate... Um, Sorry, there's a yeah. whole load of questions in this. So if you want to unpack this, it might be easier. Yes. So, um, yeah, this is an excellent question. And I think there's definitely a, uh, um, a relationship. So um, all of the images we showed there are from Big Gan. And, um, and, and our breeder actually, I think when people are using our breeder, they are um, actually manipulating Big Gan in a way uh, that it's not meant to be used because it's using invalid class of many vectors. Um, I think there's a sort of like uncanny ridge that the, the so our early texture synthesis methods uh, didn't produce great results, but they're all you know, making me pretty accurate. Um, oh, sorry, my slides not animating. Um, but in and sort of like the most artistic images of the GAN, like Big GAN is trying to produce natural images from ImageNet, which is really hard. It's not doing a great job, and so we get these really interesting artistic images. Um, uh, there's other GANs like StyleGAN um, on faces that just it just produces these great, great results uh, over and over again. It just seems like this the StyleGAN is so good that you really have to like manipulate it and mess with it to get uh, artistic images. And we see artists doing this, like Mario Klingemann has these neural glitch images where he is deliberately manipulating StyleGAN to produce glitchy results that are really cool and really interesting. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Emily Spratt. How are you precisely defining ambiguity in art? What about individual or cultural differences in perception? And uh, there's a few more, maybe you start there and we'll keep going. Sure. Um, so, uh, so this, my presentation is purely about perceptual and indet uh, indeterminacy and perceptual ambiguity. Um, so uh, I completely agree there are many kinds of ambiguity. There's in categorizing them is difficult. Even within perception, um, there are many kinds of uh, ambiguity. And part of the goal here is to um, uh, begin to analyze them in, in more uh, more detail. Um, but you know, and I think there's meaningful analogies between this kind of ambiguity and other kinds of ambiguity. So, for example, in um, novels and storytelling and movies. Um, People, you know, people say the same thing that you want to engage with the characters, you want to question um, what, what are their motivations, what is morally right and wrong. And um, these you know, more conceptual ambiguities keep us engaged in uh, narrative forms of art. Um, I think that, that sort of analogy is meaningful, um, but the work that I'm presenting here, it's really purely about the low level visual perception of shape. And really actually all I'm doing in this work is um, object identity. I'm not even like this, the kind of ambiguity in um, the impossible trident. Um, we're not even uh, analyzing this ambiguity here, a figure around ambiguity. Um, uh, okay. And yeah, so this is, yeah, sorry. No, sorry. I think that answers quite well a question and to the continuation. Um, so um, perhaps we could open it up to the panelists if there's some other questions uh, the other chairs and such would like to ask. Could I just ask briefly about the, you, you mentioned the uh, extra work that's being presented this year at CVPR on uh, converting two line drawings, that it includes a, a CNN or some kind of machine learning. Is that basically a, a kind of attention uh, mechanism where things that are semantically important, like maybe eyes or noses, uh, get lines that they don't merit by their geometry alone? Or is it something else? And, um, and we're not looking at, at uh, sure. Th yeah. Thanks for having me again. Um, in, in this work, uh, we're not doing anything high level or um, uh, object centric. It's purely um, uh, there's a geometric pipeline, which is just, you know, contours, including contours. And there's a, a CNN pipeline, which is essentially fixed to fix. So we have training sets of 
uh, you know, uh, crowd workers have labeled this is a better line drawing than that one. And um, we're merging, we, we have a, we train a joint network that includes both the geometric and low level pix to pix style CNN image translation. We haven't looked at all at um, sort of like high level choices of emphasis or attention or anything like that. And you know, obviously interesting questions for the future. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Leo. I was also curious about one thing, if, I, if there is still time. Uh, what well, the work you presented here, which actually is su super cool, actually, I like it, is focused mainly on the V1 neuron, uh, which are marvelous in uh, detecting edges and border. But uh, there are indeed other parts of the visual uh, cortex, for example, uh, LM, LI, LL, LL a neuron, which can capture more complicated features and concepts in, in some way uh, that are created by aggregating simple information like the one coming from the V1 neuron. <clears throat> so maybe I'm speculating a bit, but to try to reply to your initial question, and why we are perceiving <clears throat> line drawing so easily, we probably need to look at also those parts of the brain from a pure neuroscience, neuroscience uh, point of view, I would say. Because maybe it's not just the V1 that leads us in understanding the content of the image, but also we need to uh, grasp more, um, let's say, deeper <laughs> information. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think you can understand uh, line drawing or perception of art just by looking at uh, visual cortex or the, the V1 through whatever. Um, and there really is, I mean, kind of my argument here that people in the past have focused on V1 as an explanation for line drawing, but mm -hmm. I think you have to look at the whole perceptual system as, as a whole. There's clearly top-down effects. Um, uh, you know, really my argument is, you know, the whole visual system in, taken as a whole using all the elements of visual perception yeah. um, can somehow perceive shape and scenes and the question is why is that i i really don't know much enough about the, the details of the visual system to uh explain it and i think that these high level it's it's really hard to work bottom up and just look just at um neural processing and come up with explanations you need these these um more theoretical yeah. explanations thank you okay so that brings us to time. So thank you very much, Aaron, for your talk. It was very, very interesting, and I'm sure everyone else agrees. I'll now hand over to Leo, who will handle the paper session. Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks uh, again to, to uh, Aaron Hesman for the, for the wonderful keynote. I think it's the first time we've had uh, a proposal at Bizart, not just for computational tools for understanding art, but for computational thinking. Uh, for understanding art. I think our first uh, paper of this session is uh, by uh, Naya Grundman. And uh, I'll be handing back, in a sense, back to Stuart because Stuart will be playing her pre recorded uh, video. She's a PhD fellow in uh, cultural studies at the University of Copenhagen. Hi, uh, my name is Naya Grundmann and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Arts and Cultural Studies at the uh, University of Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, in my project, I look into object recognition from an art historical perspective and I'm specifically interested in neural networks and how an aesthetic approach to visualizations of learned features, for example, um, can inform our current understanding of artificial perception. And what I present in this paper is the early work uh, of what will become a chapter in my monograph. The paper is titled uh, On Style Transfer, and it's a comment on the use of the term style within the context of computer vision. So style transfer emerges at the intersection of computer vision and art history, but the hypothesis of this paper is that an assessment of the results made possible by style transfer techniques um, reveals deviations in the use of the term between the two disciplines rather than alignments. Um, so yeah, style is instinctively perceptible to humans and most people with a more trained eye can notice changes in style across a range of artworks. Um, but style has nonetheless proved immensely difficult to formalize which has been recognized by art historians and computer vision researchers alike. 
There has historically been a consensus regarding the ambiguity of style within art historical discourse, but today computer scientists argue that they are able to extract and transfer style from one image to the content of another by the use of convolutional neural networks, which is a task that implies that one can separate the style and the content of an image. Uh, quite a lot of people are working on this using different techniques and consequently scholars have different technical explanations of style but regardless of these uh, deviations the assertion that it is possible to transfer the style from one image to the content of another is founded um, in the claim that style and content representations are divisible which is very much in alignment with the widely accepted hypothesis that CNNs discerns patterns and edges in the lower levels of the hidden layers, whereas the higher levels differentiate between uh, semantic image content. So our history is in many ways a uh, history of style, and in spite of the term and its varying applications, art historians and cultural theorists who have concerned themselves explicitly with the concept of style, I've only uh, mentioned a few of them here. They uh, accentuate how a study of style is occupied with a profound relation uh, of form and expression and that style and content are insoluble. As a result, uh, style designates the relation between form and content as opposed to their divisibility, which is not only to say that when occupied with the style one has to take the form uh, as well as content into account, but rather that from the perspective of style, the two cannot be separated. So within the discipline of art history, the framework of style is one in which the duality of form and content is not immediately applicable. Um, yeah, so my argument is that assessing the results enabled by style transfer exposes the possibility of separating form and content rather than being an illustration of this ability and consequently that the use of the term style within computer vision is incompatible with the ways in which scholars within the field of art history have uh, defined the term traditionally. That being said, I do think that style transfers can be very convincing and I propose that when this is the case, this is due to the abstraction level of the style image used. Uh, Van Gogh's painting, The Starry Night, has been used as the style image for style transfer on numerous occasions. Unfortunately, I do not have the rights to reproduce any style transfer examples here, but I have listed a few papers uh, in which the painting has been used. So in the artwork from which the style is supposed to be transferred, the darker green and brown brush strokes are used to um, depict the treetops in the foreground of the painting, whereas the blue and yellow colours are used to portray the cityscape as well as the starry night sky. And the colours are not specific to the object they depict in the sense then that Van Gogh could and he did choose the same colour palette for separate elements within the painting, but the my argument is that the style transfer completely disregards the otherwise figur figurative components and treat them as if they were figuratively empty material to fill the shape of any given representation. So isolated, the brown-green patches do not carry any human legible content with them, but that does not mean that they can be used for colouring any content that can be deciphered by way of a discernible outline. If one is to remain true to the representational order of Van Gogh's painting, then the star representations are nothing but patches of a tree and stars floating in the same pictorial plane. Consequently, the semantic content from the star image is somehow transferred onto the content image, thereby suggesting that a sharp distinction between form and content applies to neither artworks nor CNNs. Uh, yeah, so like this represent, uh, presentation is indeed a very brief introduction to a larger body of work, but in conclusion, my argument is that the concept of style is subjected to dramatic changes as it moves from an art historical discourse into the field of computer vision, um, whereas the indivisibility of form and content is central to the conceptualization of style within an art historical context. The 
assertion that it's possible to transfer the style from one Im image to the content of another is founded in the claim that style and content representation can be separated in a CNN. And furthermore, I believe that an assessment of the results enabled by the current style transfer, transfer techniques um, exposes the impossibility of separating style and content rather than being, as I said, an illustration of this ability. Um, that being said, I think that style transfers uh, provide an immensely interesting entry point for exploring how an art historical perspective on computer vision techniques might contribute to our understanding of the capabilities of artificial perception, um, especially when investigating how the visual abilities of humans and computers differ. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I see uh, Sebastiano has style transfer now on his uh, webcam feed uh, live. Um, we, we, we aren't able to take uh, questions and answers for Naya's paper. Unfortunately, she isn't able to join us uh, this evening. Uh, but of course, her full paper is available on the ECV website, as indeed uh, are her contact details. So let's go straight into the paper, a data set and baselines for visual question answering on art, with very many co-authors that I, I, I can't list in full, but from uh, Osaka University in Japan, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, Cyber Agent Inc. Japan. Noah Garcia from Osaka will present, I believe. Uh, you should now be a panelist and you should be able to share your screen. Please put your questions uh, in the Q&A as always and uh, over to you, Noah. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay, second. Hi everyone, my name is Noah Garcia and I'm going to introduce our paper, A Dataset on Baselines for Visual Question Answering on Art. In the last few years, there have been many different applications of computer vision for art, especially when applied to fine art paintings. Some of the most notorious applications are painting classification, object recognition in art, or style transfer. There has also been interest in exploring joint language and vision models in art. For example, by using a piece of text, being able to find the painting that it is most suitable. Following this direction, in this work, we investigate the potential applications of visual question answering in art. At first glance, visual question answering in art presents some more challenges than visual question answering in real images, as questions might not only be related to the image content, such as how many people are there or is it sunny, but also to the form or the context of the artwork, such as who is the painter? The contributions of our work are fourfold. First, we explore the topic of question answering in art, which requires not only to understand the visual content of paintings, but also to acquire related knowledge about their context. Second, we introduce a preliminary dataset for visual question answering in art, which we call Aqua. Third, we propose a baseline model, which we call Viking which is able to reason over the painting as well as to leverage external knowledge. And four, we conduct a thoughtful analysis of the challenges of visual question answering on art and its potential future directions. Let me now introduce the Aqua dataset. To create a visual question answering dataset, we rely on the Seman dataset, which contains around 20,000 images of paintings each of them associated with an artistic comment, description, and some metadata. We transform this data into questions and answers for the Aqua dataset using state-of-the-art visual and textual question generation techniques. More specifically, from the image of the painting, we generate visual questions using two techniques, one based on object detection and the other one based on caption generation. Also, from the comment of the painting, we generate knowledge-based questions using text-based question generation. To generate the visual questions using object detectors, we rely on two techniques. First, we use Amazon recognition to extract the objects that appear in the image. Even though Amazon recognition has been trained using real images, we have found in our experiments that it works surprisingly well in paintings. Then. We use the detected objects as possible answers, and together with the image of the painting, we generate questions using the state-of-the-art IQAN model for visual question generation. 
let's now see how we generate the visual questions based on captions. In this case, we first generate captions from the paintings using Pythia and convert the caption to a question, an answer pair using the rule-based question generation model by Hillman and Smith. Finally, we also convert the comments into questions and answers using the same rule-based question generation model. Differently from the visual questions, the questions generated from the comments are especially focused on the context of the painting. As the questions and the answers are all generated automatically, we perform a quality check on the data. We use Amazon Mechanical Turk and ask humans to rate each question answer pair according to six metrics. Grammatical correctness, answer existence and correctness, whether the painting is necessary to answer the question, whether the contextual knowledge about the painting is necessary to answer the question, and finally, the reasonability, which judges if the question answer pair looks human generated. We found that in general, questions are grammatically correct, and visual questions tend to need the information of the painting more than the knowledge questions, which is also true in the other way around. To ensure a good quality in the dataset, we perform a cleansing with human annotators to remove samples that have strong grammatical errors or whose answer does not exist. After this process, the dataset ended up with almost 80,000 samples split into train, validation, and test set, with more than 30,000 samples being visual-based and more than 45,000 samples being knowledge-based. Also, by exploring the difference between visual and knowledge samples, we found that the knowledge questions tend to be much longer than the visual ones. Next, we introduce Viking, our baseline model to address visual question answering in art. Viking consists of three parts, a modality selector, a visual QA branch, and a knowledge QA branch. Given a painting and a question, the modality selector classifies the sample into the two different modalities so that it can go through the corresponding branch. We use a pre-trained bare model to encode the question and a ResNet to encode the painting. The samples that are predicted as visual questions are sent to the visual QA branch. We use IQN for answer prediction, train it for answering questions, which is a different model for the one used in the aqua question generation process. Finally, questions classified as knowledge base are fed to the knowledge QA branch. We create a knowledge base with all the comments in the SEMAR dataset, and we retrieve the comment that is the most relevant to the question with a two-stage strategy. In the first stage, we apply TF-IDF to rank all the comments. The top-ranked comments are re-ranked in the second stage using BERT. The answer is predicted based on the question and the best-ranked comment with a XLNet model. We first evaluate several baselines together with our Viking model in the Aqua dataset. Our first set of baselines are both blind and ignorant, answering questions without paintings and without external knowledge. The accuracy, which is measured as the number of exact matches, is less than 20%. The second set of baselines use paintings but not external knowledge to answer questions. We use bottom-up, top-down attention and ban. These models perform slightly better than the ones without painting information. Finally, for our Viking model, we have three variants. Viking without the knowledge QA branch, Viking without the visual QA branch, and the full model. It can be seen that the knowledge branch performs much better than the visual branch, which is consistent because there are more knowledge-based questions than visual questions in the dataset. The full model, however, is able to fuse the best of the two branches to boost accuracy up to 55%. Now we show you some of the results of the visual branch. and some of the results of the knowledge branch.
Although the encouraging results in our experiments, we are aware of the limitations of our work. This question answering on R is still far from being solved, and the aim of this work is to serve as an introduction to the field. We discuss the limitations of both the Aqua dataset and the Viking model. For the Aqua dataset, we found three main limitations. First, the generated questions are either visual or knowledge, but usually not both. Second, the visual questions are based on an object detector trained on natural images, which inevitably produce, introduces noise into the dataset. And third, because the question have been automatically generated, the diversity of the type of questions is rather limited. As for the limitations in the Viking model, we found that first, it does not consider the differences between the artistic styles, which is a very important aspect in the visual appearance of paintings. And second, the same sort of external knowledge information is used both for the question generation and the question answering. A more challenging scenario would be to use different sources of information to answer the questions. As a summary of this presentation, we would like to highlight the following ideas. We have introduced a new task for visual question answering in paintings. We have introduced a dataset for this task. We have also proposed a model as a baseline to solve the task, which outperforms a standard visual question answering model models by a large margin. However, in this work, we assume that external knowledge is strongly tied with the questions, which can be seen as an upper bone of the performance of this dataset. As future work, we will explore other sources of information, such as Wikipedia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Noam. So we still have uh, four minutes for uh, questions, if anyone wants to put them directly into the Q&A box. Maybe I could open with a, a brief technical question. Um, so it's, it's clear that your, your combined classifier is, um, is better than the individual ones, and this two-track approach works very well. Uh, just for the modality selector, for the thing that you, you showed on the left, which uses these concatenation of the two pre-trained uh, text and image embeddings. Uh, did hmm. you check whether it actually needs the image embedding? I, I, my, my, uh, my, my naive guess would be that you might be able to get it just from the text to mm. know whether it's something that is talking about the inside the painting or knowledge. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we actually didn't check that. Um, so, yeah, um, no, I think we didn't check that, but it's uh, very interesting. We, we definitely should check. Yeah, thank you for the... Thanks. Uh, so, uh, just waiting, as we know, it's, it's always uh, slower to type things on the Q&A than, uh, than to say them out loud. So, we're still waiting for, for something on the Q&A. But in the meantime, if other panelists have a question. We still have a few minutes left before the next paper. I can ask a question. Okay, um, so visual questions uh, can easily be answered by a single label. However, when knowledge questions are involved, probably an open-ended answer is more suitable. Have you considered this in your work or are you planning to in the future? I know that open-ended questions are very difficult to evaluate. That's why they are avoided in computer vision in general. Yeah, actually, um, our evaluation is uh, by exact match. So the point is that visual questions, the answer is usually just a word because it's the object um, or a small part in the caption, like a noun or adjective. So it's, um, we can create a vocabulary from that. And, and try to predict the word from the vocabulary. But for the external knowledge, questions might be longer than, than just a word. So we evaluate them as the exact match, as we find exactly the same phrase as the, um, as the one in the ground truth, because we are using the same external knowledge in the generated questions, for generating questions and for answering. It's easy to find the exact wording for the answer. Instead, if we use another source of information, that's why we still didn't use uh, Wikipedia yet, the evaluation will become more tricky. 
Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Any other questions from the, oh, just uh, one come up on the Q&A from, from Emily Spratt, uh, who asks, what do you see as the applications of this research? Do you see it being used in the museum world and how so? Um, mm, yeah, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, we really don't um, know ex how this can be applied for um, to the museum walls, other than maybe the educational proposals, um, or like to as a way to interact with attendants in the museum. Um, but so far, it's very um, it's um, it's a baseline, right? So the results are still not um, good enough to be applicable or to be uh, helpful for our historians. So um, maybe in the future, if this works very well, uh, can help somehow uh, people, scholars studying art, but um, I don't know. I guess more educational purposes, maybe the application. Thanks very much. Um, so that's, uh, it's now time to uh, move on to uh, our next paper, Demographic Influences on Contemporary Art with Unsupervised Style Embeddings by Nicolae J. Hakel from Bamberg, Noah Garcia again from Osaka and Yuta Nakashima from Osaka as well. Uh, I believe Nikolai Huckel uh, is now or should now be among the panelists and should therefore be able to share your screen. Yes. Hello. Hi. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, very clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, yeah, my name is Nicola Huckel. I will be presenting like a short version of this, of the presentation that I already recorded. And um, so I just skipped skip through the first part um, because it's kind of, it takes a while. Um, the, the main gist of the paper is that we tried to work with art that comes with a different sets of sets of labels, um, contemporary art to be specific, or maybe not even contemporary art, but the, the newest forms of art that is produced this this very day um, by art students. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that it really needs a really needs a really different approach when those usual labels are missing, like genre, style, or school that are most of the times used for classification tasks. Um, because when we go to um, art that has no labels that are um, in this kind of style, so genre style or school are missing, then it just needs a different approach. And this, this paper was maybe the first step in this direction. Um, and what then happens is that it's kind of, the machines are kind of used to learn about art I and mean, not just trained. Um, yeah, so what we did is we used unsupervised methods to investigate correlations between artistic style that we extracted and non-visual data. Um, and specifically, we collected paintings, network data, and general demographic or biographical data on the included painters. And we calculated three style embeddings, all of them based on VGG19. And further embeddings were calculated for the network graphs with the no to vec algorithm. And finally, all non-visual data was correlated with the extracted visual style. Um, so the first question that presented itself was how to efficiently collect data on contemporary works of art because they are not already sorted. Um, an obvious approach and an approach that has been done before would be to download images in bulk. Images that fulfill certain criteria. For example, as you can see on the left, the hashtag contemporary painting on Instagram. As you can see, there are problems with this approach. First, we cannot differentiate between amateurs and professionals 
images can contain more than just one work of art making cropping necessary or in the worst case, not contain art at all. Our solution was to use only the art of a small and validated group of art students in one country. And through this, we obtained a unique snapshot of contemporary painting culture in Germany. So um, I'll go a bit into detail into the collection, the data collection process, because it was quite, it took a long time. The first step of the data collection process was concerned with finding the art students currently enrolled at university. So we first collected the names of all relevant art universities in Germany. The universities published data on the so-called painting classes led by each of their professors. And often these classes have a web presence that contains the names of all associated students. And with these names, we could identify either websites, Instagram accounts, or both for 442 art students in Germany. The second stage of the collection process was concerned with finding all art made by these students and secondary data. From students' websites, we could collect self-reported biographical data on nationality, gender, and education. And the Instagram accounts, on the other hand, provided detailed data on the people following and being followed by each artist. In total, both of these data sources contained 14,559 images of paintings, as you can see on the right. Through the data on Instagram connections, we could construct two network graphs, a smaller one shown here in which nodes could only be artists and a larger one in which there were no such restrictions. The small graph represents a purely social network, whereas the larger one contains more detailed information on taste. The smaller network shows that it is almost equivalent to art school affiliation. Only about 10% of the connections are between students of different schools. And to a smaller extent, it is also related to geography, as can be seen, for example, by the proximity of Halle, Leipzig and Berlin. Now we come to the question of how to extract style from an image without supervision. We used the following three methodologies. The first and simplest version con consisted of extracting the second to last layer from the pre-trained VGG19 network. The second version is based on the gram-based style that is common in neural style transfer. And the final style extraction method builds upon the previous one. Archetypal analysis and older statistical method that has been used for unsupervised art analysis was applied to the texture-based style representation. In order to judge the strength of the relationship between these embeddings and artistic style, we applied two different methods of evaluation, one visual and one numerical. Both methods used the same subset of the wiki art data set. First, we, computed, we compared the performance of k-means in correctly assigning the style labels provided in WikiArt. The simplest extraction method, VGG, proved to be the best, both in the chance-adjusted metric and in the more transparent purity measure. The visual evaluation reveals the same results. We selected random reference images and compared them to the five closest images in each embedding space. VGG and Texture both managed to match similar looking images, unlike the archetype embedding. So having identified the simple VGG embedding as the best one in terms of style, we visualized the entire Contemp art data set by applying TS and E on the VGG features to obtain a two-dimensional representation. So we can see that the embeddings indeed exhibit a reasonable connection to visual style by separating broad patterns, such as colorful paintings opposite black and white sketches, as well as smaller patterns, such as unique styles of single artists. So now we arrive at the actual analysis. On the one hand, we have style embeddings per painting, and on the other hand, we have the relational data from Instagram. First, we calculate the average style embedding per painter and apply the node to VAC algorithm to both network graphs. With these transformations, both data sources are aggregated to the same level, and we can compute and correlate the pairwise distance matrices. The results show that there are only very small correlations between stylistic and social distance. Even though the two graphs are quite different, 
neither network contains information that relates to inter-artist differences in style. In a second step, we investigate possible connections between the style embeddings and the demographic data by jointly visualizing them. Specifically, we extract a two-dimensional feature space from the VGG embeddings with TS and E both per image and per artist. There were no visible patterns for any of the available variables, including Instagram-specific measures such as likes, comments, or the number of followers, and general ones such as nationality, gender, or art school affiliation. Here we show two exemplary results in which the independence of style from these factors is apparent. This is not a surprising result as the non-visual factors are primarily attached to the individual artists and not their work. Even painting specific reactions on Instagram, for example, depend more on the activity and reach of the creators than the artworks themselves. To sum up the results of the paper, we have presented the first joint study of visual style and social context on a novel data set containing only contemporary painting students in Germany. No correlations could be found between three unsupervised style embeddings and the collected non-visual data. Future work will expand the data collection to include other countries. So thank you for your attention. And obviously this paper was not only me, but also Noah Garcia and Yuta Nakashima. Thank you very much, Nikolai, for, for an extremely interesting um, paper. I'll give people a few seconds to uh, write their questions into the Q&A, which should be at the top of your Zoom bar. Um, Peter, I can see, already raised his hand. Should I start? Please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that uh, very interesting talk. Uh, it may be a very uh, traditional approach, but uh, did you also think of uh, comparing uh, the classes with, with their uh, teacher? Because they are normally these master classes, and did you see some style correlation between them or nearby classes? Very good question. Yeah, um, actually, the classes are so small um, that it, it would be hard to to get a sense of the statistic or, or visualization that would give 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 you information on this but um and also to my knowledge most of the time like just anecdotally it, it doesn't it, it would it was not a pattern that i or, or that we observed um that was the second problem but the, the main one is that it's just too many classes sure thank you Thanks. And an interesting part in your last slide about further work is that you want to expand this to other countries, um, let's say spatially rather than uh, temporally, rather than going back in time. Could you say something about that? What do you mean space? Um... Well, so, uh, you hinted on your last slide that you want to, you want to expand the data set to include other countries. Um, another expansion, assuming the data might be available, um, is to go uh, into, uh, into to previous decades and find oh. other ways for you know replacing Instagram with other kinds of, of, of social network. No, no, I've, I really find um, it, I, I would really find it more interesting to to keep adding on further data every like always like this. Um, so maybe expand to other countries and go every year um, c collect further data because. Um, because now I have I have an idea how how to do it, um, and the, obviously the country a country comparison would be very interesting and um, include more data. Now it's only fifteen thousand images, um, but include, including France or um, UK it would would make it a much bigger data set in total. Thanks, and we have um, we have now a couple of questions coming to the Q and A from from the attendees. Uh, Tracy Stuber asks, do you see this methodology being applicable to historical art in cases where comparable data is available? This may necessitate defining what is comparable. So that's a question about the style embeddings, right? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I can only assume uh, that it's, that it's uh, both about that and about the, 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 the combination with the network uh, analysis. 
So on the network, and if Nemesis, Tracy I think... wants to write in the chat, then she can clarify as well. I, I don't actually see the chat. I don't know where the chat is. Um, I think the style, I mean, the evaluation showed the, the, that the style embeddings, the unsupervised ones, um, are pretty bad in terms of like this, um, the, the style from WikiArt, like the style labels, the categories. Um, so, but visually, it kind of works. Um, but I think that there would need to be a much more rigorous um, evaluation um, th than that than was that we did here to really have some kind of trust um, in in um, in the silent beddings. Thanks. And and, and uh, Emily Spratt asks, what did your or what did you initially hypothesize uh, possible correlations would reveal? When you expand your data set, what do you expect? Yeah, um, I mean, part of that is an just anecdotal. Um, how I know the art, like how I, the, the painter friends I know, um, I just thought that there would be some correlations, maybe um, between um, nationality. That was the, the, the thing I expected the most to, um, to exist. Um, just because it's, it, it's, it seemed obvious before, before the results were there. Um, I would expect differences when more countries are included, even even small differences, but at least some. Um, I mean, the results now are really that there is um, nothing at all. Um, so yeah, I, I, if anything, I expected differences in nationality and um, yeah, countries. You you, you mentioned that the style embedding is. Um leaves something to be desired. And of course, we're, many of us are familiar with the, the, the usual problems that maybe it sees um, connections between frames or format or, or aspect ratio rather than, than things that, that um, are more commonly associated with artistic style. Uh, if you had uh, a perfect style embedding, let's imagine such a thing was possible, uh, do you think you might still expect different results? Or yeah. Correlations? Yeah, I think I think that would I think um, it could also be um, maybe on a on a on a bigger maybe not on the on the painter level how how we did it now, um, but more on on to to really see clusters. I think that that's what definitely would would be certain kind of style clusters, and they would have a small connection, um, but I think there would be a connection with some sort of um, demographic or educational um, information. Um, yeah, but that's just as it's hard to find, to find to do a really um, rigorous statistical an analysis with this. Um, the TSNE is very good, but it only shows it visually, so you can't correlate it really. Um, and extracting PCA, which has been done before with the style, um, would be would like just have a lot of noise probably. Um, but with a perfect style embedding, yeah, I would I would expect some some um, correlations. Yeah, I wonder whether there's some way of um, doing a, a choice of two between three or something like this in a in a, a crowd survey or, or oh, using yeah. self-reported style or something like this that that might uh, give a different measurement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So if there are no uh, further questions on the Q and A, um, we can uh, move uh, forward now to. Our uh, last paper of the evening, I believe, called Geolocated Time Digitization and Reverse Engineering of a Roman Sundar by Fibo Bermanaspa and uh, Mara, who I believe will uh, present. Mm. Yes. Mara Pistellato, who is, is, is here and, and uh, can now share her screen. Okay. I think I'm sharing my screen, right? Mm. Yep, I can still, I can see yeah. the screen, yep, yep. You should Perfect. see the first slide. Okay, so thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone, or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, I'm Mara Pistellato from uh, University of Foscari of Venice, and this talk will be about our work about uh, the digitization and reverse engineering of Roman Sundial. So first of all, I will briefly describe the outline of our work. 
So first, we will describe the object uh, of the study in our paper. Then, uh, after that, we will move to the digitization process that uh, brings us to have a fully high-resolution model of the object. After that, we will talk about the reverse engineering process that brings us to define uh, working situation uh, the optimal working latitude of the sundial under our study. So let's start describing what's the object uh, that we studied. Uh, this object is a sundial, it's called the sundial of Euporus, and it's a karst limestone horizontal sundial. Uh, the size of this object are roughly two meters long and one meters wide, and it's surrounded by a 10 centimeters frame extending all the, around the shape. Uh, this, um, in this particular sundial, we have that in the half of the upper surface, we have a, a set of inscriptions that reveals its usage as a sundial together with the inscription, you can also see in the, um, in the red circle the hole in which the gnomon was supposed to stay. This instrument was likely engraved uh, in the second century and uh, was discovered in uh, 1878 in the area of the Roman Circus of Aquileia. And currently this uh, object is hosted at the National Archaeological Museum of Aquileia. So why uh, this object is, uh, is so interesting for us? Uh, well, this object was found in the middle of a horse race track. So this particular place was quite strange for an object of this kind, uh, for at least two reasons. Uh, first, because this object is too bulky to be placed uh, in some other, inside the circus. And second reason, this is not uh, a typical location for an object of this kind. Uh, indeed, some studies have tried to demonstrate that this object has been built for a more southern location than the Aquileia latitude, but uh, until now, no, there, there are no actual studies that uh, show that this fact is true. Okay, so what are the goals of our project? The main goals of our project are first one, to create the first high resolution model of this artifact. And then our, um, our second goal was trying to guess uh, the most probable shape of the gnomon. And uh, for this reason, we, we, uh, we will show that we, uh, we try to find an optimal working latitude and an optimal, as long as an optimal gnomon configuration for this particular object. So let's start with, um, with the model digitization problem. Uh, first of all, we use, the, uh, <coughs> we use a 3D scanner, which is composed by a camera and a projector. And um, this particular, um, 3D scanner uh, loses, <coughs> uses uh, fringe patterns to be projected on the object. And uh, in particular, we use multi-fringe uh, patterns and uh, we use the state-of-the-art techniques to perform phase unwrapping and obtain uh, from a single capturing a range map of the object. In order to build the whole object, we capture different patches, so different areas of the, of the object from different point of view, all overlapping. And we, uh, we also define some, um, a particular uh, specific design pipeline in order to uh, merge all these views together in a single uh, surface. First of all, we, um, we pre-compute the, um, we cleaned, each, range, each, each single range map and in order to avoid the synthetic artifacts. And then after that, we clear the texture acquired in order to correct the uneven illumination and to have a better merge of the old uh, patches uh, when we bring it together. Uh, after that, 
we computed the rigid motion between each range maps and recovered the rigid motion between each couple of views. And this, uh, this process was uh, uses the, the shift feature matching between each single pairs of different views. Uh, after that, we compute our view graph. Uh, so our view graph is generated. And in this graph, we, we have that each node represent each acquired range map and each edge connecting two nodes denotes the compute transformation between such views. Moreover, to ensure the transitive consistency between each, uh, each couple of views, we, uh, we use a diffuse algorithm, a diffusion algorithm. After that, we merge all the single connected component of this view graph to in a single uh, in a single um, <laughs> in a single point cloud, and uh, use the ICP the ICP algorithm in order to have a unique uh, object. After that, we compute uh, a surface and merge all the tech and uh, average all neighbor texture to have a final uh, object. And this is a final rendering of the whole object uh, 3D model. Okay. This is also a detail of the inscriptions that we get on the top surface. So after that, we will talk about the, we will focus our attention in the describing the function on the specific, of this specific sundial. First, a couple of words on how the sundial worked. Um, the sundial uses the, uh, in general, a sundial uses the apparent position of the sun in the sky to tell the time, and it's composed by two main, um, parts, a gnomon, which is an object that casts a shadow on the surface of a sundial, and the dial, which is a usually flat surface in which the shadow of the gnomon is casted. Geometrically, the line that connects the sun with the tip of the gnomon describes a cone in a frame which is rotating around the earth, and the shadow of the tip is located at the intersection between this cone and the sundial plane, forming a conic session. So the actual uh, kind of a coning depends on where this, the plane on the upper and sign position is located, and usually it's on a parabola. We can see that uh, from this uh, picture of the, um, of the surface of our sundial that we have uh, three main curves representing in blue the uh, winter solstice hyperbole, in yellow the summer solstice hyperbole, and in red, the spring and autumn equinox line. The, in our, so in our particular case, we have that the tip of the sundial will cast a shadow along these three particular lines, along uh, four specific days, along a year. And moreover, we can see these 11 uh, black marks, so these black segments, which represents the uh, division of the day in equally uh, light times. So uh, we have that uh, uh, these particular ancient sundials do not display the clock time as we are used today, but these ancient sundials simply divided the daylight time into equal parts. So indeed, since daylight have a variable duration depending on day and latitude, each time slot uh, will depend, in its duration, will depend uh, on the latitude in which the sundial is used and on the time of the year, of course. Uh, to get the, optima, the optimal gnomon shape, we imagine a simple configuration for this kind of object. And we uh, use a segment which goes from P1 to P2 uh, in this case, we have that uh, the point P1 is right above the base of the gnomon, while the point P2 is uh, located uh, slightly tilted uh, above and uh, in the front of the point P1. Uh, 
um, we have that uh, we also have their uh, projective shadows, which are P1 first and P2 first, and they depend on the direction of the sun, which is a vector denoted by S in the picture. Uh, so, um, we have some constraints to respect if you want to uh, represent well the behavior of this particular sundial. And uh, specifically, we have that during the sundial operation, we expect that the projection of P2, so we expect that the point P2 first should fall uh, in. Um, during uh, the um, during the winter solstice, uh, it should follow the higher hyperbole, so the blue one. We have that during the summer solstice, this uh, this shadow should trace and should go along the yellow hyperbole. Moreover, we have that during the equinoxes, so during the autumn and spring equinoxes, the shadows should uh, go along the central red line. Moreover, we have that at each corresponding timestamp during, uh, uh, during a day, each shadow should fall on, uh, on the black marks. And this is for the point P2, which is the end point of the normal. The, the point P1 instead should, should uh, only follow on the, on the black lines. And uh, so the only requirement for the point P1 is that the line casted from the gnomon should be parallel to the time marks denoted in black. Uh, to estimate the gnomon shape, we used our first acquired 3D model. And uh, using this uh, accurate 3D model, we recovered the coordinates of the 33 points, which mark the intersection between the equinox and solstice curves together with the 11 time marks of the day. These points were stored in a rank-free tensor V, and we will use this fixed point on the sundial surface in order to compute the optimal, uh, uh, the optimal latitude together with the optimal position of points P1 and P2. Uh, so the goal, as I said before, uh, our goal is to estimate P1 and P2 uh, lying on the gnomon, and uh, such that the gnomon shadow is projected as close as possible to the points that we highlighted in the, um, in the previous slide. Uh, so since the sunlight, uh, uh, so sundial working latitude is only affected by the project node, by the project node's projection of point P2 uh, during the equinox and solstices, uh, we divided the tasks uh, into, uh, into part. So the first part of our optimization is focused on the recovery of the, of the endpoint of the normal, so uh, of the point P2, and on the optimal working latitude of the, of the sundial. Then, once we fixed uh, the latitude, we, uh, we go on on the computation of the point P1. Uh, the P2 optimization is computed together with the latitude. And in order to do that, we selected a set of years and formulated the optimization as a nonlinear least square problem. Uh, in this formula, we can see that we um, formulate the optimization by minimizing the distance between the project, projection of the point P2, denoted by P, as uh, with the points we marked on the sundial. Um, regarding the optimization of P1, we fixed the latitude and P2, and we simply compute the um, P1 uh, such that its projection fall as close as possible to the 11 time marks in the, in the dial. Uh, we set as initial condition uh, the Aquileia latitude, so the place where the sundial was actually found and uh, our reasonable configuration of P1 and P2. After the optimization, we found out that P1 is roughly uh, five centimeters above the base of the gnomon, and uh, P2 is slightly tilted above. The results of the, 
of this optimization is shown in this rendering where we added the uh, virtual gnomon to our 3D model of the sundial. And you can see, for example, in this case, we have the summer solstice and, uh, the, and the shadows, shadows projected by the gnomon actually falls really close to, to the line. And finally, uh, this is the winter solstice. Okay, so uh, let's back, uh, go back to the, uh, to the first part of our talk. I said that uh, the, the optimal working latitude may not be the latitude of Aquileia where the object was found. Uh, and what was the latitude of, uh, that we found at the end of our optimization? Well, we found out that the, this object was built or at least it works well for latitudes which are 116 kilometers south of Aquileia. So uh, a possible hypothesis is that this, the sundial inscription was copied for another object designed for a more southern location and then it was roughly adapted uh, to, to the Aquileia region but making maybe some mistakes and makes it's, uh, it's functioning not so perfect in the, in the Northern Italy area. Okay, so to conclude, uh, the outcome of this work is twofold. First, we provide the first high resolution digitization of the sundial of Europorus. And second, we try to devise some characteristics of this archeological object using a data-driven approach based on our accurate measurements and uh, on geometrical modeling. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Mario Pistelato. Uh, it's a fascinating paper with which to conclude. We still have four or five minutes for questions if anyone wants to uh, put them into the q and A. I could just open with, with a, a very brief one. Um, did you look at the uh, uncertainty? I'm sure you looked at the uncertainty in measurement. You, you mentioned your, your um, projection scan at the start. Did you look at the uncertainty in uh, manufacturing, more or less? What, what, kind of, um, what kind of tolerances are, let's say, uh, possible to make with, with human hands? And, and is that within the 160 kilometers error bar? Uh, you mean about the, the design? Of, of the dial or about the, the precision of, of the inscriptions in particular? The, the second one, the inscriptions, the, the, you know, the precise line. Okay, uh, so what's, well, the, um, the precision is roughly, uh, let's see, the, the inscriptions are actually few millimeters thick. So yeah, it's quite, uh, it's quite a high precision to, to be matched and uh, when we, when we uh, well, the, the first test that we made was to simulate, to optimize the, the normal, only the, the normal points, keeping the latitude fixed of, of Aquileia. So we, we, we first tried this kind of test and we see that actually the, the shadow were, were really, really bad. It falls a lot far away from the original design. Um, it was like about some few centimeters I will say. So yeah, uh, these kind of mistakes, it's uh, um, bring uh, very, very inaccurate uh, measurement in these terms. So yes, it could be that it was adapted, but not so well to work in, in this kind of latitude, maybe by some person that was not very expert in the field and uh, try to adjust some points, but with, with no perfect uh, outcome. Thanks. Thanks very much. If, if another panelist has a, another question, otherwise I would ask which city 160 comes. Do, do we have any other questions from the panelists? No. So, so which, which place 160 kilometers south? Presumably, uh, if you go in a straight line, you're in the sea. Uh, yes, but since the, um, 
Well, if we remain in Italy, I guess it's something around Ancona or some cities around there. And is there, let's say, material archaeological mm -hmm. evidence to... to... Uh, we, we are going to... We, th this is a, a future work, let's say. This, is a, this was just a preliminary exploration in, in this kind of object. And then we, we have to, to see the, some further implications. So maybe if, uh, if you're able to find some similar artifacts, maybe lying in the central area of Italy, maybe we can relate it with, with this specific sundial found in Aquileia. So maybe some people built another sundial in the center of Italy and use this maybe the same design, bring the same design to the north. And uh, so, yeah, so this is another line of in investigation that's, let's say, more archaeological than, uh, than computational. That was our, our part of the work. Thanks. Um, well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to, to Mara and to, to Nikolai, to Noah and to uh, Naya. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's not easy at all to present online. It, it's much less easy to present online at one o'clock in the morning. So. <laughs> extra special thank you to, to everyone and to everyone who's still with us listening. And uh, Stuart now will make a few concluding remarks, I think. Okay, one second, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Uh, so, as Leo said, um, I will provide some concluding remarks for this year's edition of VizArt. If we look at, back across the various editions of VizArt, we start to see reoccurring themes. One such theme is always on object detection. And it's interesting to see how this has been developing over the various editions of VizArt. If you look back to 2016, uh, we had work such as the work of Crowley and Zizermans on the art of detection. It was focused purely on just object detection across different um, styles of artwork. However, now we're starting to see how we can develop techniques that are actually able to understand the structure and the content within the image simultaneously. Um, specifically, how we can understand the compositional structures in our historical images using pose and gaze priors, such as the work of Marquette et al. This combination goes beyond just object detection using starting to create higher level inferences. Another interesting direction for Visa is around the use of style. We already saw in uh, many applications, generative adversarial networks being used, and it was even highlighted in Aaron Hertzman's talk earlier this evening. But now we're even starting to see how we can exploit style transfer to improve the localization and um, retrieval of artwork, such as the work in, in this morning's uh, session of VizArt from Afar Tao. However, there still remains many open challenges. And one of the main challenges that's always reoccurring is access to data. Uh, Andres Mayer actually commented on how much information they're digitizing or have to digitize within the Time Machine project. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it's 80 kilometers of archives in Venice. But much of this information struggles to trickle down to the VizArt community. Uh, and it's a continuing issue. However, there is hope and um, Aggregation sources such as Europeana and Wikidata are making much more um, artistic content available with Creative Commons licenses. That's great to see. A kind of more question to the audience in some ways or for people to ponder and contact us if they're interested is whether there needs to be the establishment of benchmarks. In every edition, we see new data sets. Even in this edition, we saw several different data sets um, being added to the collection. Uh, an example of this from this session is Garcia Tao's um, data set and baseline for visual question answering on art. Uh, despite the challenges of translating this into real world applications, there's still 
um, strong benefits in developing baselines and techniques and benchmarks for us to be able to exploit in the future. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending this edition of VizArt, um, especially our keynote speakers, Aaron Hertzman and Andreas Mayer, uh, Andreas Mayer being from this morning session. Uh, all of the authors, even the ones from this morning session, and the reviewers that did lots of diligent efforts commenting and editing on people's um, work. Uh, in addition, on behalf of my um, co-chairs, Alessio, Sebastiano, Leonardo, Peter, and myself, we'd like to thank you everyone who partook in this year's edition of VizArt uh, and put up with the struggles of being put online and recording videos. And we hope that you have enjoyed this and will be able to join us again in a couple of years at ECCV 2022. Uh, and that we hope that that will be in person. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to everyone. Good night. <laughs> Thank you to everyone. Thanks. And thanks Thank to you. Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs>